Hello, everyone. Uh, this is now the time for our afternoon session. When I say afternoon session, I think it's for the uh, audience on the uh, East Coast. Uh, if you are actually joining from the West Coast, the thing is still burning. Uh, if you are joining from New York, you can now take a seat me. If you are actually joining from Asia, I uh, think you are now New York. So regardless of your uh, time zone, I uh, welcome to our session, session number four. Uh, the first talk in our session uh, is uh, on high speed uh, uh, PA, uh, PA design. It's given by about the Gabriel in the world. So let me first introduce uh, uh, Gabriel. The talk of Gabriel in the world is due to PA design from the University of California, Italy. He has worked in several companies, including SP National Point, the Instruments, and National Semiconductor. And so it's right now with ML devices. The third electricity of ISICT, we have a co editor uh, of course, ICW two, and then a co editor and editor in chief, so I could believe uh that one. He's currently the editor in chief, so I could be open journal of Cato in system. We have written more than fifty series with Cato, we book, and as well as uh we granted seventeen CS packets. So we have received multiple awards. Okay, I'm increasing the volume of my uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Sorry, uh, this is an audio problem. Um, uh, I guess it's okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Is it getting better? Yeah, sorry for the audio. I guess we have some problem in the audio. Is it getting better? It's still bad. Okay, I think in the state, uh, for the sake of time, I guess I will maybe skip because of the technical problem. I'll skip the uh, introduction and we'll move uh, to the uh, uh, the talk directly. Welcome to the tutorial on high-speed current steering D2As. My name is Gabriele Manganaro and I work at Analog Devices in Wilmington, Massachusetts. In this tutorial, we will first introduce the different types of architectures and segmentation. We will talk about mismatches in current sources and ways to mitigate their effect on static linearity. We will then look into frequency dependent nonlinearity. We'll talk about the impact of finite output impedance the behavior of the switches, and circuits to deal with all that. We'll also briefly talk about timing skews and their effect on distortion. We'll also we'll have a look at different layouts and floor planning techniques. Finally, we will apply what we learned with four examples of recently published RF tags. Let's begin with uh, some principles of operation. The input to a current steering DAC is a digital code or word composed of n bits. The output is an electric current that represents an analog equivalent of this code. This digital to analog conversion is obtained by controlling an array of current sources as we are about to see in the next slides. If an output voltage is desired, this current can either be fed to a resistive load or to the virtual ground of a trans transimpedance amplifier. In the first case, we need to be mindful that the swing of the node voltage X does not affect the behavior of the current steering array uh, and therefore um, introduce, introducing distortion on I out. In the second case, while the swing at X is ideally negligible because it's a virtual ground, on the other hand, 
uh, the current to the voltage transfer transformation may add uh, noise and distortion. Moreover, the trans impedance amplifier stage will require some additional power. The most straightforward implementation of a current steering duct uses an array of binary weighted currents. Uh, the bits D0, D1, all the way to Dn-1 represent the input code to the duct. Each bit is associated with the current that is sized accordingly. The least significant bit is D0, and it corresponds to I0. The next bit up is D1 which correspond to current I1, and I1 is two times the size of I0. The next bit up is D2, associated with current I2, and current I2 is four times the size of I0, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, if a bit is equal to one, then the corresponding current is sent to an output load RL. If the, if the bit instead is zero, this current is sent to a ground. So what each bit is doing is this determining the state of the corresponding switches, which are called the steering, the steering pair or the steering switches. And so if, if this is one, turn on the right switch, turn off the left switch. If this is zero, do exactly the opposite. So as you can see, this is very straightforward. We really have uh, n current sources for n bits, and all that is required for each of these bits is to determine the state of the switches. And then the currents uh, get added to the output, and so we get uh, we get the conversion done. However, what's the problem with that? Well, it relies on our ability to ensure that the currents are accurately sized to implement the binary weights. Any mismatch between them affects the weights and introduces code-dependent errors to the output. Any code-dependent error introduces distortion. Accurately Accurately matching very small currents to very large currents can rapidly become very challenging. Instead of using n binary weighted currents, we can do the conversion using a set of 2 to the n minus 1 identical currents. The mechanism is the same. The input code is used to control the direction of the currents by turning on and off the switches. The currents are summed into the output load RL and the, and the output voltage is obtained. This time, however, the input bits cannot be used directly. A thermometric code controls the switches. A thermometric code representation has as many ones as the value of the input code. If the input code is 5, then the thermometric code has 5 ones and all other bits are 0. If the input code is, let's say, 56, then the thermometric code has 56 ones and all others are 0. So if the input code is 5, then 5 unit currents are steered into the load and all others go to the ground. If the input code is 56, then 56 unit currents are summed into RL and all other currents are steered to the ground, and so on and so forth. A binary to thermometer encoder is easy to design. The order of the thermometer bits is not important. Building identical current sources and switches and matching them to one another can be easier than matching the way the currents of the previous example. On the other hand, this architecture grows with the power of n, and therefore it can be very challenging and cumbersome as the number of bits grow. Another strength, strength of this architecture is that it is inherently monotonic, namely, an increase in the input code 
always results into an increase of the output, even in the presence of mismatch. Moreover, for the same reason, if a code transition results into an output glitch caused by an individual array element, by the individual array elements, then the net magnitude of the glitch caused by multiple elements being switched on or off will be proportional to the code itself. Therefore, the conversion tends to be inherently linear, also dynamically. None of that is necessarily true for the binary weighted case. So here we have an animation. We have all of our unit currents. They are all the same. However, depending on the state of the thermometric code, this will end up to the load or they will end up to the ground. In order to strike a balance between complexity, physical size and linearity, most stacks adopt a hybrid thermometric binary architecture. This is what is usually, usually called a segmented DAC, since it is composed of two sections or segments, a thermometric segment and a binary segment. <clears throat> the most significant bits control a thermometric DAC. We will call that the MSB segment. The least significant bit will control a binary weighted DAC, which we will call the LSB segment. Here is an ideal segmented DAC. The output current of the two segments is summed at the load RL as usual, and the residual current is steered to the ground. The total current of the LSB segment is equal to one of the unit currents in the thermometric MSB array. So as you can see, the sum of all these currents is equal, equal to one of the unary uh, currents in the MSP segments. Then this current is being split in binary weighted fashion. A simplified implementation with PMOS transistors is shown here. The output in this case is fully differential and no current is being wasted by being steered to a ground. The top transistors, MCS, are the current sources. They are all identical and they must be working at the same quiescent point, namely with the same VGS, VDS, temperature, etc. The CAS code, MCAS, help ensuring that boosting the output impedance and isolating the current sources from what happens at the output node. Um, the unit uh, current used for the LSP segment is split in a binary fashion by means of the cascodes in the LSP segment. The corresponding switches are also usually sized in the same way. This is to ensure that the quiescent point of all these transistors is consistent and indeed the current splits according to the geometry of the transistors. For 12 to 16 bit DACs, it's very common to have a 6 or 7 bits MSP segment and to implement the remaining bits with the LSP segment. Sometimes people will split the LSP segment into an upper or intermediate LSP segment and a lower LSP segment. The intermediate LSP segment will also be implemented with a thermometric DAC, while the lower LSP segment will be binary weighted. Another popular approach to implement a binary weighted DAC is by means of a R to R splitter. In this case, instead of a binary weighted current array, we use a set of unity currents directly controlled by LSP bits. However, the unity currents are added together through an R2R resistive network. <clears throat> 
This network splits the current by two through, through shunt resistors before adding them. Matching these resistors is not hard since the network can be easily built using identical resistors. However, this, work, this works well at low frequency, but it can be problematic at high frequency due to the strays at the internal nodes of the R2R network, which cause a different, a different response for different bits. Well, we have seen some examples of P-type DACs sourcing the output current to a ground load. N-type DACs are also very common. In this case, the output log hangs from VDD and the current is sunk by the DAC. Sigma Delta ADCs often use current steering DACs that have a complementary structure and can provide a bi-directional output current, as shown in this diagram over here. It is apparent at this point that mismatches in the currents will cause errors on the output current. At low frequency, we talk about static linearity. Integral and differential nonlinearity measured by INL and DNL characterize the deviation of the output current from the ideal staircase output. DAX designed to ensure that the current matching is sufficiently high for the specifications are called intrinsic matching DAX. Since the matching of the MOSFETs used to build the current sources depends on their physical area and quiescent point, intrinsic matching DAX will easily lead to large transistors with large overdrive voltages. This is in conflict with high frequency performance and power consumption requiring small capacitive strays, and it is in conflict with lower, power, lower supply voltages, limiting the headroom of the transistor stack and the output voltage swing. Alternatively, DAC mismatches can be allowed to happen, relaxing the other design constraints, if calibration is used to correct for manufacturing imperfections. We'll have a look at some calibration techniques later. While this is the dominant mechanism to distortion in the megahertz range, a number of other nonlinearity become non-negligible at higher and higher frequency. The output waveform will be corrupted by undesired transients, or in the frequency domain, it will be corrupted by spurious content. As you've guessed, anything that is code-dependent introduces harmonic distortion, while non-code-dependent glitches will introduce non-harmonic spurs. So in general, linearization techniques will either attempt to make settling code-independent, or they will attempt at making the glitches so fast that their spectral power is outside the band of interest. We will spend considerable time in discussing that linearization. Noise is often characterized by means of noise spectral density, or NSD, that is contributed by device noise, merely ther thermal noise originating from the current sources, as well as by spurious sources such as substrate noise, supply noise, and disturbances originating primarily from digital circuits. The noise analysis and design of DACs is similar to what's done for noise analysis and design in current sources, so we will not spend much time on this, on this in this tutorial. We will talk a bit about ways to manage substrate and supply disturbances. This is an example of the spurious free dynamic range profile for three different DACs as a function of increasing output frequency. As you can see, the spurious free dynamic range often starts very high at low frequency, where it's only determined by mismatches in current sources. And then it gets worse and worse as the output frequency increases and as a number of other factors and other mechanisms uh, that uh, become prominent at high frequency degrade the overall performance. Uh, the uh, intermodulation distortion is uh, yet another way to uh, characterize nonlinearity, this time with uh, two-tone excitation. 
but the story is essentially the same. You start with a very high linear behavior at low frequency, but inevitably as the frequency increases, the, uh, the distortion increases and so the IMD also drops. We'll talk now about matching the current sources of the dark array. By the way, as a reminder, the static linearity of a converter is often characterized by DNL and INL, as we said uh, a minute ago. What are DNL and INL? Uh, well, the transfer characteristic of a converter is an ideal staircase where every step is identical and we call its size the LSB. In practice, however, due to a long list of non-idealities, the actual size of the LSB steps is affected by errors, which make them all slightly off from their ideal LSB size. Some steps are a bit too large, some, some are a bit too small. The size of this error for each step is the DNL. So the DNL will be positive for some codes and negative for other codes. So the DNL is a local error. As you sweep the codes and follow the actual staircase, the errors will, will accumulate. So the actual staircase will begin departing from the ideal transfer characteristic. Now, the actual error measured between the ideal position of each step in the ideal transfer characteristic and the actual position of the same step in the real staircase is the INL for that code. Clearly, that error results from accumulation or integration of all the steps up to the one you're measuring. That's why INL stands for integral nonlinearity, while the error on the individual steps, uh, which is the DNL, is called the uh, differential nonlinearity because it's a local error on that one step. Let's imagine to give the DAC a digital input consisting into a slow ramp and to monitor the output current. Let's pretend for now that the LSP segment, which is binary, has no mismatches. As the code goes from all zeros in the LSPs to all one in the LSPs, the output goes from zero to IU, which is the total current that the LSP can give. Once we reach the full scale of the LSP segment, one of the unary sources of the MSP segment turns on and the LSP segment returns to zero. So if there is a mismatch between the IU of the LSP segment and the IU of the MSP segment that just turned on, you will see a discontinuity on the output right here. Now, as we continue increasing the code, once the LSB segment reaches its full scale, then another IU of the MSB segment is switched on. So again, if there is a mismatch between this one and this one, that will cause another uh, uh, gap. And as you can see, these gaps are actually fairly high and uh, give large discontinuities, which are called major code transition errors. Now, let's pretend that the unary, current, uh, the unary current sources are all perfect matched and instead let's consider any mismatches in the LSB segment. As we increase the input one unit at a time, any mismatches in the binary array will result into a nonlinear output. The same nonlinearity is replicated again and again and again after any major code transition because it's always created by the same sequence of errors in the LSP segment. So as you can see, these devices lead to the major code errors. 
and the mismatches in these devices instead determine the signature of the uh, LSB segment, which is replicated here and here and here once we put it all together. So how to mismatch a rise? Well, there are a number of reasons. Besides um, lithographic imperfections and parametric spread, both of which are random, provided that layout is done properly, there are a number of additional causes for mismatch. On the left-hand side, we have an array of four nominally identical current sources. So these are all identical. However, a gradient in threshold voltage over the array, uh, such as due to manufacturing or a temperature or mechanical stress gradients, will cause the devices to give different currents. So uh, this gradient will originate different threshold voltages, and so uh, everything else being equal, the, the output current is also uh, showing a gradient. On the right, when we account for finite resistance in the power rail, we see the gradual supply voltage drops causes the devices to have slightly different quiescent points. Uh, again, the output current will be different with a spatial distribution. Now, if these devices are arranged into an array and their assignment to input code is such that they will turn on in a sequence that follow the input code progression, then gradients of current errors track the code and directly lead to large INL. Process or power gradients can be linear, such as a plane with represented as a function of space, or they could be quadratic such as a second order curve in space, etc., etc. An arbitrary surface in space can be represented as a combination of planes, parabolic curves, third order curves, etc., etc. If we activate the current sources in an orderly fashion, column by column, row by row, as the code increases, then gradient errors will accumulate and affect the output INL in a straightforward and substantial manner. In order to counter uh, effect of the accumulation of gradient-based mismatches, it is better to change the order of activation of the current sources. That is what is done by means of different switching sequences. In the example on the left hand side, we have four devices suffering of a gradient mismatch. The corresponding DNL is shown below it, and the DNL um, uh, adds up to a large uh, INL right below it. So, this is the uh, now if we sweep uh, the code from uh, the first one to the second one to the third one to the fourth one, now, now obviously we, uh, we generate a large, uh, a large distortion. Uh, however, um, uh, if we change the order of switching, meaning the order in which we turn on the devices, then the errors uh, uh, of the individual DNLs are basically the same, but we can uh, um, make sure that the DNLs will add to a tighter INL. Uh, and so this is, this is essentially the same idea of using a common centroid layout for placement of capacitors in switch cap circuits, or uh, for the input devices of a differential amplifier, namely, we rearrange the order of the function of the devices in order to compensate for gradients. So as you can see here, we're, we're going from code 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. So that's just 
basically what is normally done in common centroid. And we end up therefore with a smaller INL. Now this can be generalized to more than a small linear array and a simple monotonic gradient. Because arbitrary gradients can be represented as the composition of a plane, of a quadratic surface, a third order surface, and so on. And we can look at large arrays of nominally identical devices placed in space. Similarly to what just explained for the case of four devices, we can change the order of switching of the devices for an input code ramp. For example, starting from the center of the array, let's look at this one, for example, uh, starting from the center of the array, we switch the sequence left and right, left and right, left and right, left and right, and this uh, breaks a growing linear ramp into a zigzag line that does not accumulate that much. Similar results are obtained for, for a parabolic gradient. Another approach is to break the array into two. So instead of looking at this array, uh, we look at the same array where we break it in half, and now we do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what we're doing is that we jump between the two half of the array. And this is another possibility, again, that jumps within each array, do left and right, and then you do left and right between the two arrays. So it's basically a nested centroid in one dimension. Now this one dimension approach can be extended to two dimension and it can be nested at multiple levels. And that's what is shown in this diagram over here. By going this way, arbitrary gradients get broken, folded into them themselves. Again, the individual step size errors don't change that much. You still have the gradient, you still have the errors, but we do not allow them to accumulate into large INL errors, which would otherwise cause large signal distortion. Here is a symbolic implementation of what we just described. So these are all the currents in the array, but as you can see, we have reconfigured the order of the currents, or in other words, the association between the different thermometric bits and the corresponding currents. Uh, the, and uh, and, and this, way, this one following the rules that we have just seen. So this switch in sequences can be deterministic as those that we have just seen, or they can be random sequences. Also, we can hardwire the switch in sequences, just like what is done for a common centroid layout, or we can scramble the switching order with the digital permutation circuit that reassign a new sequence every so many clock cycles. Dynamic element matching techniques work like that. If the spatial order is randomized, then the spurious power is randomized. When you look at the output with a spectrum analyzer, you will see small random spurs added to the noise floor instead of seeing the power of the large spurs concentrated in a few output harmonics. If the switching order is deterministic and the frequency of the output is small compared with the clock frequency, then it's possible to shape the scrambled spurs to be smaller at low frequency and higher away from the design signal. This is commonly done for tax in noise shaped over sample ADCs, though it doesn't work as well in the absence of oversampling. Here are other examples of deterministic switching sequences that represent nested two-dimensional switching sequences. One more time, this won't do anything to random mismatches due to lithographic errors. 
this works for mismatches resulting from continuous regular gradients in space, which are inevitable when we have a large current source array. We are really not correcting the mismatches. We are simply minimizing their impact to the output. So if the devices aren't designed for proper random matching up front, we still have a serious problem. Another option is to calibrate the mismatches, namely to find a way to measure the errors and to correct them so each unit is identical to a single reference. This will work regardless of the source of mismatch, whether it is a random lithographic limitation or a manufacturing gradient or even a systematic layout error. Let's then talk about calibrating current sources so they all match to a common reference current. So let's consider this simple circuit. This is called the carrying copier. In an actual implementation, the switches are, and the current sources are all transistors, but for the time being, let's not worry about that. On the left, a bias current IB is forced into a diode connected MOSFET, which then develops a gate source voltage. If in addition to that, we add an input current I in, the corresponding VGS develops across the stray capacitance of CGS, and the drain current is IB plus I in. Now, uh, Let's open the two switches on the left and close the one on the right, connecting it to a load. Since the gate is floating and VGS stayed at the prior level uh, stored on CGS, then the drain current didn't change. Therefore, I out is, well, I out ideally is equal to I in. Basically, you can think of this as a current mirror where the same device has been used as the input device of the mirror in the first phase and as the output device in the second phase. Another way to look at this circuit is as an analog memory that stores the input current I in into CGS. Now let's make this circuit a bit more realistic. Let's use actual transistors for the switches. When we do that, then some non-idealities immediately appear. First of all, when we open the switches on the left, the negative charge stored in the channel, as well as the charge from the clock feed through of the switches, end up on CGS. That leads to an error on the memory. However, this error can be minimized as in other techniques for charge injection. Plus, the switches are often small as they don't need to turn on or off uh, fast. In addition to this, due to the uh, reversed bias drain substrate junction of the transistors, we effectively have a leak on the charge stored in CGS, which causes a slow voltage droop on the gate. So this memory is discharged over time and a periodic refresh is needed. What do we make of all of that? Here is a regular DAC current source, one, composed by a current source's MCS the CAS code MCAS and the output switches. So current source, CAS code, output switches. We add a few more transistors to this. First of all, we add the memory current source MM in parallel to MCS. This memory adds a bit more current uh, to the source MCS. The total current is the sum of the two. If the total current is too high because MCS turn out to give too much current, then MM 
will add just a little current to the total. If the total is too small because MCS turn out to give too little current, then MM will add more current to compensate for it. Typically, MCS will be larger to supply 90% of the desired total current, while MM will be much smaller in order to supply a remaining 10% to 20% of the total current for error correction. So how do we do that? We add three more switches to the stack. When we want to calibrate the total current to be equal to a reference I ref, we close the switch on the left, dial connected this one by turning on the switch, and the total current is forced to be I ref. So I F plus I V will be forced to be I, uh, I ref. So in other words, I V will adjust in order to make up for the difference. No matter what, uh, no matter what it was due to, to the current errors. At this time, the current source is disconnected from the output, so the output node. So this one is open, so it's not operating. Once MM has stored the missing current and the total current is equal to IREF, MM goes into storage mode and the total source current is reconnected to the output structure to be used. So basically this will now uh, uh, open, this will close, and so now the total current which is equal to IREF can be used by uh, the current array. The currents of the DAC are then calibrated against the same references, one at a time in a cyclic fashion. In this way, we also perform the required refresh and we can track for changes such as those caused by temperature drifts. Since one current source is always offline for calibration, we need to have a spare current source ready to replace it and operate at the time. This cyclic recalibration runs in background while the rest of the DAC operates as usual. The cyclic switching on and off can show up at the output in the form of a small spur at a frequency dependent on the rate of refresh. If this is problematic, then one can randomize the frequency of refresh and spread the spur power away. So this is a background calibration. And as we said, that the cyclic disturbance can, can introduce spurs, but we can basically randomize the uh, refresh rate and get rid of it. A different implementation of the same idea shown here. Instead of using a local analog memory that leaks and needs to be refreshed all the time, the memory transistor has been replaced by tiny calibration DAC. This can be small, and using only a couple of bits. After all, we are amending a small error. This actually uses a small local RAM storing the DAC, the CAL DAC bits. Uh, the calibration works in the same way. During CAL, the difference between the reference current and the total current determines the uh, value of the correction current, which is stored in the current cell. Uh, this time, we can do a foreground calibration at startup. We can store the corrections and never change them again. After that, we can operate uh, the DAC. Now for another important non-ideality non leading to distortion. Um, current sources used in DACs obviously have finite output impedance. This means that a portion of the current that does not make it to the load introducing a small error. Since the number of currents steered to the load depends on the code, then the error due to finite output impedance is code dependent. So that means it leads to distortion. It can be proved that for a single-ended output DAC, um, this will lead to a strongly quadratic INL bow over here. So this is the DNL, this is the INL. Uh, now if we use the same array for a differential output DAC, uh, 
then much of the even order nonlinearity is removed, is cancelled, uh, and in fact the net distortion is largely reduced. But we are still left with odd order uh, uh, distortion. So that would be the DNL in the fully differential case. And this is the INL. Uh, it's third order, but is, uh, if you can read these uh, uh, scales, it's, it's down by 90% uh, comparing this one for, with this one. Unfortunately, being an impedance, its magnitude will drop with increasing frequency. If we want to keep it high enough to support high linearity at high frequency, we need to minimize the stray capacitances contributing to it. A detailed analysis of the high frequency behavior of a differential output duct will show that the uh, third order distortion holds up to a certain level until the signal frequency reaches the corner frequency of the current source impedance. After that, the third order harmonic distortion will degrade twice as fast as the impedance drop. So what can we do if we cannot make omega zero high enough? A very effective technique was introduced in this paper. Here the others are not trying to make the corner frequency unrealistically high. The distortion that not, does not really happen because the impedance is finite. The distortion arises because the total impedance at the output node is called dependent. So what they do here is that they try to make the total impedance called independent. It can get small, but as long as it is called independent, it will only lead to linear attenuation, not spurs. How? What they do is that they put another set of cascodes, transistors MC, between each steering pair and the output. Then they add two small current sources, uh, IB, that keep a minimum of current flowing through both the cascodes MCs. These currents keep the MCs alive whether or not the steering pair is sending current to the positive or the negative output node. Because remember, the switches, they will only carry current in one leg, not in the other. So if we want to keep these guys alive, we need to have at least some current. And so that's why sometimes these current sources are called the keep alive currents. Now, if the sources IB are large enough to keep MC in strong inversion, then the cascode CGS is nearly constant. So the, the, the CGS here is basically constant. So if we do that, then the output capacitance um, of uh, either side of the, of the steering source is approximately constant and equal. And so is the output impedance introducing errors to the load. So now we have the same impedance or the same capacitance on the positive and the negative. This error does not the, uh, is not codependent anymore, and so and so it's not it's finite uh, impedance, but it does not introduce codependent error. This is a very this is very effective and it reduces this distortion mechanism substantially in exchange for some linear frequency attenuations. Obviously, the capacitance will, will introduce some attenuation, but attenuation that is, is not distortion. <laughs> Let's look now at the most delicate part of a DAC with respect to distortion. That is the common source node of uh, the steering pairs. We'll also talk about how the drivers used to control the steering switches work. Ideally, the uh, current sources are constant. 
and their output impedance is high enough that any voltage change at the common source node won't affect the net output current that much. Unfortunately, we have already realized that this is not the case. A voltage change at S will lead to dynamic current IU causing an error at the output. So the ZU is contributed by all by the tail current source and its parasitics, by the switches and its parasitics, mostly the CGSs of the switches. And finally, stray coupling with adjacent circuitry creates a path for additional disturbance as at S. Now, the node S can be disturbed through multiple mechanisms. First of all, the varying output voltage will couple through the on switch, and if the switch is operating in saturation, then it's attenuated by the intrinsic gain of this transistor. But this gain is finite, and it will drop at higher frequency due to parasitics. Secondly, you get coupling to S from the control signals of the switches. As you, as you try steering the current from one state uh, to the next one in a perfectly balanced manner. Lastly, you can get disturbance from neighboring cells and the ground may bounce due to supply noise. Uh, anything that is codependent will introduce distortion. On the other hand, disturbances that are synchronous with the clock cause offset and constant spurs at the end of the Nyquist band, so they don't matter that much. However, some mixing with the clock can frequency shift some out-of-band spurs into the band of interest, so we still need to be careful. We'll need to keep all these effects in mind as we look at the following circuits. There are several ways to drive the steering switches. The simplest way is to use a pass gate latch. The control signals here are a swing from rail to rail. The transition is really fast, triggered by the clock edge and the positive and negative edges of the control signals change together. However, such hard transition can disturb the node S in a way that it takes time to return to its original quiescent point, and that shows a code dependent distortion to the output. Moreover, the gate of the on switch can be pulled high enough to leave little headroom for the output swing and drive the switch in triad. A smaller swing and a gentler transition is obtained if we introduce a low swing CML driver. This can be designed to keep the switch's input common mode constant and also S as, a co as constant as possible. However, it requires a Class A driver that can be large and power hungry. Another option is to flip the steering pair and use a lower supply for the driving latch, which could be the back-to-back -back inverter latch that we saw earlier. In this way, the switch's common mode can be made lower and more constant. However, we can still have a problem with the output voltage headroom. In order for S to stay constant, it is particularly critical to minimize its disturbance during the state transition. Depending on where and when the crossing of the control signals occur, the S may be temporarily pulled up high or down. If the transition occurs in such a way that as not to disturb the pair's common mode, then the disturbance at S can be made small and quick, hence minimizing harmonic distortion.
That, by the way, is mainly third order harmonic distortion. While we can mathematically find the optimal transition point, we actually need some circuit to make it happen despite PVT drifts. Here is a possible way to do that. We take a copy of one of the current sources and set the switch fully on. We can actually throw away the off switch. That's what we have on the left. This replica determines the desired Vs. Then we take another replica, this one here. We drive that using a latch where we have, um, where we have a way to control the skew between the control signals. So we can control the crossing point. Now we make this latch switch on and off, on and off, on and off. And while we do that, we sense the difference between the quiet node on the left, uh, which is the reference voltage, and the average voltage on the switching replica. The difference is used to control the crossing point. The loop determines the right crossing point that makes the difference between these two minimal. The resulting control voltage is used to control the cross point of all the other latches which are actually used in the duct. This tracks variations and it's as good as our ability to match all these replicas. Another effective way is what uses the so-called differential quad switches. The principle is the following. The issue with the traditional dual switch is that the S is disturbed when the code transition is required. So code dependent errors cause distortion. What if we were to disturb S at every clock cycle, regardless of the code? Well, then this particular issue will not contribute to distortion. So how can we do that while steering the current to the right output node only when it's needed? The trick is to add an extra switch to each side. If the current needs to steer to the left, then the two switches will turn on and off alternatively at every clock cycle. If the current needs to be steered on the right hand side, then these two switches will turn on and off alternative at each clock cycle. So basically at each clock cycle, there is always one switch which is turned on and all the others are off. So there is always a disturbance at Vs no matter what the code is. And the current is still going in the direction determined by the code. And in this way, we have realized this code independent. Um, and uh, this happens all the time, but it's called independent. So far, we have dealt with issues that happen locally on the individual current cells. However, there are plenty of problems that cause distortion at a global level. One that is particularly severe for the very high frequency performance of the current steering ducts is the timing skew between the current cells. All current cells that change state need to do that at the same identical time. However, that is harder to ensure due to multiple sources of timing skew. This diagram shows the main sources, which we will now analyze one by one. Mismatches between the interconnects delivering clock and code to the cells will lead to timing skew. The other problem you should pay attention to is the following. Look at the latches. If the latches are in changing state, when the clock change state, then there, 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 there aren't lots of inner nodes change, charging and discharging. However, if the latches have just changed input when the clock latches it, there is quite some charging and discharging. Therefore, the local clock line will experience different loading and different local delays that are codependent 
even if the layout of the routing network is equalized. Let's look at the output rail. The output of all cells should sum up at the output node at the same time. However, different delays at the output rail will cause skews. As usual, if these skews are systematic, for example because of layout, then will likely correlate with the code and cause distortion. If the output frequency is low, small skews are relatively negligible and have little effects. However, as the frequency of the output increases and its period narrows, the same identical skews are now relatively much larger in comparison. Hence, the impact of the output becomes more and more visible and the distortion are larger. Once again, let's consider four current sources in a thermometric duct. If they all steer the current in the same direction at the same time, the output changes by four IUs in a seamless manner. That's what you see on the diagram on the left. However, if there is a gradient resulting into a gradual skew of the transition times, the transition of the output current spread, and while the effect is clearly visible, uh, it is intuitive that it won't result into peak distortion. But if we consider now for current sources in a binary weighted duck, things get bad very quickly. If the skew between the elements is as shown in the figure, most of the waveform is heavily distorted, as you can see here. So we need to equalize these delays. One approach on the left is to compensate the delay in the routing of the controls to the switches against the delay in delivering the outputs to the load. The cell that is closest to the load is switched last, and the cell that is farthest from the load gets switched first. If the delays are equal, the output gets summed up at once. One delay cancels the other. This may not work exactly in practice, but it can at least reduce the spread in time due to the delays. A more systematic approach is the one to use clock trees. Clock trees for the clock ensure equal routing of the clock to all destinations. We can play the same routing trick to the outputs. In fact, we can, we can use this trick for lots of other signals as we will, as we will see in a few slides. This is a great segue to the important topic of layout and floor planning. You can do a flawless transistor level design, but if you do a mistake in the layout, your duck won't work at all. In terms of floor planning, there are two popular styles, a one-dimensional array arrangement or linear floor plan and a two-dimensional array arrangement uh, known as matrix style or Manhattan style since it resembles the map of New York City. As we talked about earlier, routing trees can be applied to multiple nets, clocks, outputs, supplies, biasing, etc. This approach addresses also issues with RI drops on supply rails, biasing lines, etc., etc., because this gets equalized too. The issue is trees, uh, the issues with trees is that they will also result into very complex layouts with lots of large parasitics. So use it with great care. Let's look at the linear floor plan in greater detail. Here is an example of the arrangement. The top allocates the quiet part of the array where current sources and biasing stay physically separated from the switching action. The current source devices and the cascodes are neatly packed together uh, for best matching and, and minimal gradients. As we move to the bottom, we have the switches which are connected straight onto the output rails. South of the output rails and way and away from the sensitive analog, we have the latches. 
The control signals connect to the switches traveling very short distance and their lines are perpendicular to the output. Positive and negative of all signals crossing one another have balance coupling that ideally cancel each other. Finally, the digital encoders and all the other noisy digital stuff sits at the bottom, far from the quiet analog. In the Manhattan style, each cell is realized in a very compact layout with very minimal internal node interconnect strays. The issue with this style is to get in and out of the CD block, so to say. There is a wide matrix of rows and columns, digital lanes traveling over the array like the, like the broad avenues of Manhattan. Local logic reads these lines and determines if they are supposed to change the current direction. While this style was all the rage in the 80s and 90s, a few people still use it. Here is an example of a Manhattan floor plan. Here is instead an example of a linear floor plan. More examples of linear floor plans. You can see the current sources all neatly packed together, also over here, in a clean and seamless layout. You can also see the output rails and the latches and the logic away from the analog section and away from common source nodes. The stacks are from a company called S3 and from NXP. So here is another example of a linear array. Within the intermediate section, uh, devices may still be placed uh, in, um, in a matrix arrangement. Uh, And here is another linear floor plan where the black dense rectangle is the current source array. Uh, if you pay close attention, you can see the output current rail here flowing vertically uh, to the top and all the switching stuff, uh, it's on the left hand side. Uh, that's it. This is another ADI duck. And here is a broad duct using again a linear floor plan and showing various trees. Here you can see tree, 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 tree. Uh, this is another ADI duct showing the linear array, uh, the output rails, the latches, and the switches are on the opposite side. Let's change topic altogether now. Uh, Oftentimes, before a digital signal is provided to the DAC as an input, people will do all kinds of digital preprocessing, such as filtering, up conversion, interpolation, etc. We will not have time to cover any of that, uh, but there are certain types of signal processing uh, uh, that, can be, uh, that can be done by the converter itself, depending on how we deliver the output to the load. We're going to briefly mention that in this section. So let's consider a digital signal with this FFT. As you can see, this is a band-limited signal centered around 125 MHz and bandwidth of about 70 MHz. Uh, note that this, uh, both the axes are linear. If we provide this uh, digital input to a traditional DAC clocked at 500 MHz, the output spectrum will look like in this plot. Uh, now, in this example, the DAC is a non-return to zero DAC. This means that the output stays on for the entire clock period. And when the next clock period comes, the output instantaneously jump to the next converted value. We all know that this is the same as what happens to the output of a zero order hold sampler. <laughs> 
namely that the output is, convol is the convolution between the input signal spectrum and the sync function with nulls and fs and its multiples. So the images of the input are frequency shaped by the sync function with the first Nyquist signal having the largest power. In passing, please note uh, that as you can see, even the first the Nyquist image, image gets a low pass filtered as you approach Fs over 2. So what uh, some people do is to put a digital pre-emphasis filter in front of the DAC called an inverse sync digital filter. That can mitigate this effect and even out of the frequent and even out of the frequency response in the first Nyquist band. In this case, our waveform will look like in this plot, and it corresponds and its corresponding spectrum is shown in the right hand side. The nonce have moved at twice the original frequency. Unfortunately, the power of the output has also dropped to half. It should all make intuitive sense. The output is on effectively for half the time, so that it has lost power. Moreover, we have something more similar to an ideal pulse train, which does not suffer of sync shaping, so that nodes are shifting to higher frequency and the lobes are widening. By the way, besides evening out the size of the different images, there are many practical reasons why you would want to do that. For example, as you steer the current in the array cells, there will be codependent transients that luckily die out rather quickly. You could design your DAC in such a way that the output is delivered to the load only after these transients have become negligible. So, what if instead of having the output on for half a clock cycle, we keep it on for one third of the clock cycle? Well, in this case, the nodes have moved to even higher frequency and the power of the images has dropped further. The sync function is spreading accordingly. We can see here the corresponding three frequency shaping functions. So we have the sync function for the non-return to zero DAC. And then we have here barely visible the uh, sync for the uh, uh, return to zero uh, DAC with uh, half cycle. And then finally the sync uh, for the return to zero with uh, one third uh, duty cycle. Uh, there are two notable other options I'd like to mention here. The first one is the dual return to zero seen on the left hand side. This is basically like having two return to zero DACs using the same code, feed into the same output, but shifted by half a clock from one another. Why bother? Because you get the design advantages of the offered by a return to zero DAC, but now your output is active for the uh, whole clock cycle and uh, you recover the full output power of a non-return to zero DAC. On the right hand side, we can see the mix mode DAC. In this case, the second half of the period is identical to the first one, but flipped upside down. What happens if we do that? Well, the frequency shaping function changes in a very interesting way. If we compare it with a regular non-return to zero DAC in mixed mode, two very interesting things happen. First of all, since the output is going to zero twice as often, you can see that the effective sample rate has essentially doubled. And because of that reason, the nodes are now at 2FS, 4FS, etc. But the signal band didn't change, since we're still converting one code per clock cycle. However, in this case, the power of the first Nyquist image has been attenuated. 
Well, the power of the second Nyquist image has been magnified. We have effectively moved much of the power of the images into the second Nyquist band. Well, that's nice because we effectively done an upconversion of the signal. By the way, implementing this trick is not too difficult when you use a quad switch, but be warned because this is a patented technique. If you think of it, this can be even more interesting in the dual return to zero or the mix mode. What if instead of keeping the same code for both the half cycles of the clock period, you use two subsequent codes for the first and the second half period? Well, in this case, you'll effectively be converting at twice the rate. As a matter of fact, you are basically performing a two times interleaving DAC. This is called the dual data rate mode. And just like for time interleaving the disease, you will need to watch out for mismatches between the two interleaved conversions because spurious content will show up just like for time interleaved the disease. Again, the quad switch is a natural fit for that. And again, be warned about patterns. All right, we could go on with more techniques for days and days, but since I'm not gonna go to do that, I will rather show you a few examples of recent DACs that use what we have covered so far. I need to immediately make a disclaimer here. Each of these examples will fit tight into a 30 minutes presentation. So I'm not gonna, do, not gonna be covering all the important aspects of these examples. What I'm gonna do is that I will show you the implementation of the techniques we have learned in actual tax. The first example is an ADI DAC for a few, from a few years ago. It's a 16 bit 10 giga sample per second DAC implemented in 65 nanometers. In this example, we will use the, we will see the use of the quad switch and the technique that uses cascodes with keep alive currents. Uh, to remove the distortion due to finite output impedance. Moreover, this DAC enables regular non-return to zero mix mode output, single and dual that data rate. This block diagram represents the DAC architecture. Starting from uh, the upper left, there are eight 12.5 uh, gigabit per second service lanes that provide up to five giga, giga sample per second at 16 bits. The DAC has signal processing that can be configured from uh, two to 24 times interpolation for both wideband and narrowband applications. The output from the top digital section is fed to the decoder for segmentation and multiple parallel paths from the decoder get serialized up to the DAC rate. The output switches update the data above clock cycles so it can perform a dual data rate that we have just learned about. Clock management and internal loops maintain lock across uh, PVT variations. On the bottom right are the current sources that supply the desired full-scale uh, output current. This diagram shows the complete DAC output stack. So let's have a look at uh, what is going on. Uh, closest to the outputs are thick oxide cast codes that isolate the internal core devices from the large output swing. However, these devices are slow and would, if left alone, generate data-dependent settling issues that are not completely isolated by the DAC switches. This causes distortion. To eliminate this issue, a second set of core devices cascodes were added in between the switches and the output cascodes. These devices settle at the maximum DAC rate, attenuating the distortion mechanism due to settling. The stack utilizes a quad switch architecture to eliminate distortion due to data dependent switching. We learned that a few slides ago. 
And finally, we have the keep alive currents to keep this gas code on uh, no matter what the code is, and that will take care of the, uh, the distortion due to uh, finite output impedance. Uh, and um, uh, since the, we have four switches and four cascodes, then we need the four keep alive currents instead of two. So this is the corresponding SFDR plot when the duck is clocked at uh, uh, three giga sample. This is the dash curve and a 10 giga sample per second. And that's the solid black curve. And this is the intermodulation distortion curve for three giga sample and 10 giga sample per second. We synthesize full band doxes to 1 gigahertz. Uh, two channels in the middle are taken out to show the leakage of adjacent channels. The whole spectrum is very flat and we achieve a, a pretty good uh, ACL. Uh, this is uh, the result for two bands and multi carrier signals. And we have a group of carriers that is centered at 1.8 gigahertz, and the other group is centered at 2.2 gigahertz. And the CLR is better than minus 74 dBc. We also synthesized up uh, 4.5 gigahertz for carrier signal and 69 dBc ACLR. Uh, the noise performance is also very good. Uh, the NSD uh, is below uh, 168 dBc uh, over hertz up to 800 megahertz. And as you can see uh, from this plot, the NSD is really limited by sampling clock jitter. Here is a doc published by others from Ohio State University and from Teledyne. Um, this is a 10-bit. 0.13 micron by CMOS stack with a clock of 3.35 gigahertz, but, but the output frequency is going up uh, all the way to 20 gigahertz. First of all, since the clock and uh, data rate is 3.35 gigahertz, uh, then the maximum theoretical signal bandwidth is half of that, so that's approximately 1.68 gigahertz. In fact, uh, they have a 1.65 gigahertz max bandwidth. Uh, how can you have a millimeter wave output frequency up to 20 gigahertz with only 3.35 gigahertz clock? Well, we are about to find out. Well, they do that by using a multiple return to zero scheme. Specifically in this diagram, they use a three times return to zero with a corresponding mix mode option, but uh, uh, no multi-bit data rate. Um, so for those of you which are not immediately inclined to resolve this frequency shaping puzzle, here is a cheat sheet. The shaping turns out to be so that uh, for uh, the regular MRZ, multiple return to zero mode, you get this weird powerful lobe in third and fourth Nyquist band. That's the black curve. Um, this gets even more emphasis if you operate it in mixed mode. That's the gray curve. Uh, here we are in the 10 to 13 gigahertz range. Uh, in their measurements, they went higher than that by increasing the frequency of the return to zero clocking until they, uh, they moved the lobe into the um, 20 gigahertz range. So here is the architecture, starting from the bottom. They divide the 10 bit into a 4 bit MSB thermometric segment and a 6 bit binary LSB segment. So you can see here the R2R uh, network, and these are all uh, the same. Um, also, they use a dual switch, as you can see, but they implement the return to zero using another set of switches to short the output to VDD when you want it to zero it. So these are the regular switches determined by the code. And here, if you turn this one and this one, you give the current to the output. But if you want to zero the, the current, you turn this one and this one, and you take it away from the output. The LSB segment, as we said, they use identical current sources. 
and make a binary weighter using an R2R network. This makes the matching easier, including matching the skews between the switches, which is super difficult at this frequency. Speaking of that, here is the 3D layout structure they use, which includes a very careful design of the output rail tree, minimizing phase shifts at such high frequencies. So that's an example of a, a tree uh, on the output rail. And uh, this is the data path showing the flip-flop on the left, followed by a CML data driver. So this structure is what you see here, and here is the actual current uh, uh, steering pair. So we have here the current source, which is calibrated. This is a cascode. These are the switches, and these are the switches for uh, doing the return to zero, as we uh, have discussed. Uh, this is the uh, layout and the floor plan and the complete chip views is on this side. So you can see the most current sources on the right, away from the switching, together with the calibration DAC. The R2R network is right over here in light blue. And the shape of all this stuff is really not that important because anyway it's being calibrated. The important thing is to keep it quiet. Namely, without too much disturbance coming from the switching circuitry, which is over here. Now, on the bottom left, there is a linear floor plan for all the latches, switches, etc. Feeding into the output rail over here. And that's where all the action is really happening. On the right hand side, we have the complete chip view. And here is a snapshot of the SFDR performance. As you can see, while the linearity of the DAC is expectably lower than the previous DAC, the output frequency range is much higher. The next example is an even more recent DAC presented by Broadcom two years ago. Um, this is a 16-bit, 6 giga sample per second DAC in 16 nanometers. In this example, we can see again a double cascode stage uh, with, with the keep alive current uh, to deal with finite output impedance. You can also see an analog calibration loop uh, for the self-calibration of the current source, just like what we covered earlier in this tutorial. Each current source is temporarily disconnected from the array and compared against the reference in order to be adjusted to match the reference. In this work, there is an additional twist to the recalibration to which I defer you to the paper for its complete description as we wouldn't have enough time here. Uh, but the general concept is as follows. The authors note that what most calibration algorithms do is to match each current source to a reference. By doing so, you try to minimize each corresponding DNL in isolation. However, the large signal distortion is really determined by the INL. And while smaller DNL will certainly limit the INL, we have also learned earlier in this tutorial that INL builds up from DNL as you sweep the transfer characteristic. So what the others do here is that as they calibrate the individual current sources in the array, they also accumulate the residual error from the prior calibration step into the next calibration step and adjust the reference accordingly. By doing so, they actually directly tighten the net integrated error and hence the INL. In order to do so, they need to have a very fine current resolution on all current sources reference included. The other technique they employ here is to shuffle all the current sources after calibration. This takes care of additional mismatches both in currents but also in timing skew between cells spreading the power of spurious images into the noise floor. This plot shows the performance results. The last example from University of Southern California is a 16-bit 12 gigasample per second DAC that has a very original architecture, which we are going to have a look at quickly. <laughs> 
Well, uh, we'll start by making an observation about the type of tax uh, we have considered so far. In Nyquist tax, the output signal band can be as wide as half FS. These are typically very high sample rate tax, and because of the sync function, the first Nyquist image is what is being used. The DAC is then followed by low-pass filter, called reconstruction filter, which suppresses the higher order images. These DACs are very fast, but hitting high linearity specs is very hard and can consume quite a bit of power. However, if you have a narrow band signal, these DACs are very flexible because you can do all signal processing in the digital domain and then synthesize your output anywhere in the first Nyquist range. The first and third example we have seen so far fall into this category. Then we have a mixing DAC. While we haven't looked at this category in extensive detail, the second example, the one of the multi non return to zero, um, well, it's one example of that. This case, in this case, you have multiple images of a narrow band input, and your desired output is a higher order image here, for example. The DAC is designed to suppress the other images as much as possible, but then you need the passband filter centered at the output frequency so you can further suppress the undesired images. Power consumption is generally lower, especially if you do the up conversion in a smart way, like using a quad switch, and the clocking is actually lower frequency than the output signal. And there is another class of tax called hybrid, where the MSP segment is a regular Nyquist tax, while the LSP segment you use a delta sigma tax. What is a delta sigma DAC? In the extreme case, it's a single current source clocked at a higher multiple of the sample rate and the single bit stream controlling the current source is the output of a digital delta sigma modulator with the LSP bits as its input. Why? Because a single bit DAC is by definition completely linear. The delta sigma modulator shapes the quantization noise so that it can be low in band as if it was a multi-bit DAC and all the spurious power is moved out of band where an analog filter is then used to suppress it. Why bother? To try to get the best of both. Most of the output power is created by the MSP segment, while the small signal part is synthesized by the delta sigma LSP contribution. You try to get uh, the wide band of a Nyquist DAC with the high linearity of a delta sigma DAC. Watch it, however. To make it all work, the synthesized signal band needs to be narrow enough that you can handle it with a delta sigma modulator. Or in other words, you need to have high oversampling ratio. Here is the architecture of this DAC. We have a four bits in the MSP segment. Then we have four bit binary LSP segment. So in this 16-bit DAC, the remaining 12, bit, 12 LSP bits are implemented with a multi-bit, 4-bit Delta Sigma DAC, not a single-bit DAC. This allows some relaxation on the oversampling ratio. Secondly, they use a bandpass Delta Sigma modulator since they synthesize, their synthesized output is narrowband and it sits at a higher frequency instead of baseband. There is a whole story about the way they implement the digital modulator and do an inverse sync that we won't dare to get into here. Also, since they use a multi-bit delta sigma, then they need to do dynamic weighted averaging to scramble the mismatched spurs of the 4-bit LSP, LSP segment. 
Last but not least, note that they use a CML driver to keep the swing at the switches mounted. Here are some specifics comparing the case of a hybrid DAC with a low pass uh, Delta Sigma modulator on top of the figure versus the case of a band pass Delta Sigma modulator on the bottom of the figure. In the first case, you can see that the quantization noise shaped to, to grow out of band at a higher frequency. But to get oversampling up to eight, you have to you have a crazy output rate on the red path. In the second case, you have a bandpass modulator for a narrow band signal. The quantization noise grows out of the narrow band, so here and here, of the synthesized output. But you can run the red section at the more reasonable clock rate. Here is a die picture and the power consumption breakdown. Not surprisingly, since lots of this architecture is digital, that's where most of the power lies. However, this architecture naturally scales well within, with lithography. They use 65 nanometer because that's what they could gain access to. But think of this implemented in, say, 16 nanometer. And here is the performance plot. By playing trade-offs between the rate of each of the two segments, you can exploit the linearity of the delta sigma modulator more. Not surprisingly, the highest linearity corresponds to the highest rate for the LSP. Let's conclude this presentation with a few hints to other topics we couldn't even hint at today. There is a wealth of literature on the topic of segmentation and how to get the intrinsic matching right, both for static as well as dynamic effects. However, modern DACs rely less and less on intrinsic matching and various types of calibrations have enabled huge milestones in performance. There are volumes of literature on the art of driving the switches and circuits to do that. Why we only hinted a shuffling and dynamic element matching, including for Nyquist DAX. There is a lot more to say about signal processing techniques used in conjunctions with DAX or enabled by particular architectures. Last but not least, there are very many specialty DAX that are conceived for custom applications in audio, instrumentation applications, etc. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm open to take questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the nice uh, talk. So uh, I, I hope that my audio can work now. Uh, so let me uh, welcome uh, all the audiences uh, to attend our session. Uh, and also let me kind of very quickly uh, introduce the speaker uh, if uh, like my, my audio has some problem in the beginning. So Dr. Gabriel Magnaro received a PhD degree uh, from the University of Catania, uh, Italy. He has worked in several companies, including ST Microelectronics, Texas Instrument, and National Semiconductor. He's currently with Analog Devices. He served in the TBT of ISSCC, was associate editor for IEEE TCAS1, and then associate editor and editor in chief for IEEE TCAS1. He's currently the editor in chief uh, for the IEEE Open Journal of Circuit and Systems. He has written more than 60 peer reviewed papers, three books, as well as 17 US patents. He received multiple awards, including 1999 IEEE uh, Circuit System Outstanding Young Author Award, 2007 IEEE Asterisk uh, Best Paper Award. He's an IEEE Fellow, uh, was a member uh, of the Board of Governors of IEEE Circuit System Society, a distinguished lecturer uh, for the IEEE Solid State Circuit Society and, and industry advisory member for proceedings of the IEEE. Okay, uh, so this is the end of my brief uh, introduction. Uh, so let's go uh, to the Q and A's. Uh, so we have one question uh, posted by uh, Tim Dixon from uh, IBM Research. So the question is about uh, uh, evaluating the SFDR and SMDR at the output of a high-speed DAC. So because the output is continuous time waveform, uh, the spectrum is shaped by the sync function. Uh, so uh, I guess the, so the question is that uh, for high frequency signals, the signal suffers like a 4 dB loss of attenuation uh, at half of the sampling rate, uh, so even for the case of the ideal ADC. So is this uh, a common practice to correct for the frequency response of the zero-order hold? 
when you evaluate in that email? Um, yeah, so what uh, uh, the, the, the question is correct in the sense that, as we were discussing earlier, uh, you, uh, you suffer from uh, uh, sync uh, frequency shaping. So the real answer is uh, it, it depends. Some people will. Um, so here it is the slide. Um, this is a slide that sort of uh, shows you the um, the issue of the, uh, associated with the sync function. So the the, the answer is depends. Uh, some people will um, correct for uh, so so will basically do an inverse uh, sync correction to the data in order to 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 sh to show uh, the SFDR, and some people don't. And uh, the, the 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 real answer is that uh, uh, I mean, what really matters is uh, how how your DAC is operating, despite the fact that you have the sync function. Now, if you really want to have a, a true assessment of the linearity. Then uh, another way to to measure it is through um, two tone test. In which case, you you cannot be fooled by the fact that your tones are basically at very high frequency, and so there may be uh, an additional effect. Uh, the, the, so as usual, in, in in every in every situation, you can never trust a single. Uh, you know, a single metric and make judgment. You need to use multiple uh, multiple metrics. Even if you if you were to adjust it for 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 sync shaping, uh, again, you're better off by getting multiple multiple metrics to 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 really understand what the what the real situation is. Great, thank you. Yeah. So just to uh, remind the audience who may not uh, be uh, not attending in the morning, so if you want to uh, uh, post a question, so please use the bulletin board and then put it in. Uh, and then I will be, uh, so I'm Don, uh, Don Sun from UT Austin, I'm the session chair. So I'm going to ask the question for you. So uh, audience cannot directly ask uh, a question uh, by audio. So I'll ask the question uh, for you. So please, if you have a question, please post it uh, on the uh, bulletin board. By text. Okay, so maybe uh, at the meantime we have still some time. So let me, let me ask a question. Uh, so uh, I, do you, so Gabriel, do you see a trend that is uh, that for high-speed DAC design? Because like a lot of this more recent high-speed DAC are designed in advanced process. Do you see that more and more digital techniques being used in order to make the DAC like to be more, let's say, scaling friendly? Uh, I'm sorry. What do you what do you mean with that? Uh, so I mean, like when you mentioned that for mismatch now, nowadays we don't really design the, the, the for example, design the DAX uh, to be very uh, matching very good, but rather we use calibration oh, oh. Use techniques to compensate yeah, for yeah. that. Yes, more yes, more. yes, yes. Yeah, I, I got it. I got it. Yeah, most most recent DACs are really calibrated. Uh, first of all, the first thing you want to calibrate is the current sources and uh, and and. You know, obviously, uh, as I mentioned during the presentation, if you go with an intrinsic DAC, you end up with very large current sources. And, and, and basically, the entire stack becomes large, and, and the parasitics are really going to kill your performance. So uh, because of this reason, because of the fact that calibration of current sources is now a mature approach, uh, most recent DACs are really... Uh, uh, besides the current sources, or rather the devices setting the current sources for a, a bare minimum amount of, uh, of matching, but really eventually calibrate uh, everything. And so, and so everything is smaller, uh, capacitance, capacitances are smaller, and it's easier to go faster, and it's easier to, to fit within the headroom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, definitely the trend is to use calibration uh, much more intensively than in the past. Got it, thanks. And then there's one other uh, now a, a new question. So one question raised by uh, Benjamin Hirschberg from IMAC is how should we terminate a very high-speed DAC? How does inductance play a role when driving off-chip? Uh, so in the examples design given, uh, we see both on-chip and off-chip termination. Which one is the best? So it depends from application to application. Uh, the, uh, 
the very best situation if you're driving a, 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 a virtual ground, if you're driving a trans impedance amplifier, if you do not go off chip, you stay on chip and drive, uh, and you, you drive a, a virtual ground, that's the best case. You don't have any swing, and uh, the current uh, it all goes where it's supposed to go. And uh, but, but that's one situation. I guess the next best, especially if you have to go off chip, if your if your load is off chip, uh, the next best is to drive a balloon. Uh, and yes, you need to you need to worry about the, all kinds of inductances that come in the way between uh, your uh, your output switches all the way to the load, because obviously as you steer current at very high speed, the inductance will react to the current and develop a voltage that goes against you. Um, so so again, the next best is to 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 drive a balloon, and then the secondary of the balloon uh, really drives the the subsequent load. And uh, now the third best, so to say, is to drive uh, essentially a, a matched load, uh, you know, or, 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 or basically a, a resistor. So. Yeah. Great, yeah. So I know we have like one final question from Tim Dixon again from IBM Research. So on slide 32, you show an architect, a technique with a keeper current as a way to keep output impedance relatively constant. So how large is this keeper current relative to the LSP? And how does this impact vacuum as you have larger voltage job across the load resistor? All right, let me get to, to 32. Okay, so here we have the keep alive current, and so let me see what was the question. So the how large is this keeper current? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So the keep alive current uh, really doesn't need to be very large. It just needs to basically ensure that you're operating over here. That the that, 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 that the cascade is staying on. Okay, because obviously when you um, when you steer the current from one leg or the other, you'll have uh, one leg which is driving the current to the load plus the keep alive current, and the other leg would only have the keep alive current. So, so in one leg, you basically are operating somewhere over here. I don't know if you can see the, my mouse. The other case, you will be operating somewhere over here because now you have the keep alive plus uh, the, the actual current that you're steering. And, uh, you know, typically the keep alive, uh, it, it just needs to be a, a small fraction of, uh, of I, uh, IU. It could be, let's say, uh, you know, a quarter or even less than a quarter. Now, the one thing that you have already realized is that with all these keep alive currents through the array, you really have a DC bias on your load. So you need to keep that into account because it will create uh, – basically uh, a bias on the load and so, but then of course when you take the output differentially, uh, as long as you have not, uh, you know, damaged the headroom, you you remove that. And so, but yeah, it's a, it's a small fraction. It could be a quarter, it could be less of, of IU. All you need to do is just to keep it alive, just making sure that you are in this region over here, so that when the current uh, uh, that is supposed to go, uh, when, when IU is supposed to flow, you, you, you end up somewhere over here. And C, CGS, it's approximately constant. Great, yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. So I think this is the, uh, I guess, uh, the end of uh, this, uh, this talk. So let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you very much to you. Bye. Thank you.